To this day, I cannot quite say why. Perhaps it was an instinct to seek familiar places, or the feeling that if there were authority anywhere, it must be somewhere in that direction. The brandy had made me more hungry than ever, but I did not find the problem of feeding as easy to deal with as it should have been. And yet there were the shops, untenanted and unguarded, with food in the windows, and here was I with hunger and the means to pay, or if I did not wish to pay, I had only to smash a window and take what I wanted. Nevertheless, it was hard to persuade oneself to do that. I was not yet ready to admit, after nearly thirty years of a reasonably right respecting existence and law abiding life, that things had changed in any fundamental way. There was, too, a feeling that as long as I remained my normal self, things might even yet, in some inconceivable way, return to their normal. Absurd it undoubtedly was, but I had a very strong sense that the moment I stove in one of those sheets of plate glass, I should leave the old order behind me forever. I should become a looter, a sacker, a low scavenger upon the dead body of the system that had nourished me. <laughs> Such a foolish niceness of sensibility in a stricken world. And yet it still pleases me to remember that civilized usage did not slide off me at once, and that for a time at least I wandered along past displays which made my mouth water while my already obsolete conventions kept me hungry. The problem resolved itself in a sophistical way after perhaps half a mile. A taxi, after mounting the pavement, had finished up with its radiator buried in a pile of delicatessen. That made it seem different from doing my own breaking in. I climbed past the taxi and collected the makings of a good meal. But even then, something of the old standard still clung. I conscientiously left a fair price for what I had taken lying on the counter. Almost across the road there was a garden. It was the kind that had once been the graveyard of a vanished church. The old headstones had been taken up and set back against the surrounding brick wall, the cleared space turfed over and laid out with gravelled paths. It looked pleasant under the freshly leaved trees, and to one of the seats there I took my lunch. The place was withdrawn and peaceful. No one else came in, though occasionally a figure would shuffle past the railings at the entrance. I threw some crumbs to a few sparrows, the first birds I'd seen that day, and felt all the better for watching their perky indifference to calamity. When I had finished eating, I lit a cigarette. While I sat there, smoking it, wondering where I should go and what I should do, the quiet was broken by the sound of a piano played somewhere in a block of apartments that overlooked the garden. Presently, a girl's voice began to sing. The song was Byron's ballad. So we'll go no more a roving so late into the night, though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath, and the soul wears out the breast, and the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself have rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. I listened, looking up at the pattern that the tender young leaves and the branches made against the fresh blue sky. The song finished. The notes of the piano died away. Then there was a sound of sobbing. No passion. Softly, helplessly, forlorn, heartbroken. Who she was, whether it was the singer or another weeping her hopes away, I do not know. But to listen longer was more than I could endure. I went quietly back into the street, seeing it only mistily for a while. Even Hyde Park Corner, when I reached it, was almost deserted. A few derelict cars and lorries stood about on the roads. Very little, it seemed, had gone out of control when it was in motion. One bus had run across the path and come to rest in the green park. A runaway horse with shafts still attached to it lay beside the artillery memorial against which it had cracked its skull. The only moving things were a few men and a lesser number of women, feeling their way carefully with their hands and feet where there were railings, and shuffling forward with protectively outstretched arms where there were not. Also, and rather unexpectedly, there were one or two cats, apparently intact visually, and treating the whole situation with that self-possession common to cats. They had poor luck prowling through the eerie quietness. The sparrows were few, and the pigeons had vanished. Still magnetically drawn towards the old centre of things, I crossed in the direction of Piccadilly. I was just about to start along it when I noticed a sharp new sound, a steady tapping not far away and coming closer. Looking up Park Lane, I discovered its source, 
A man, more neatly dressed than any other I had seen that morning, was walking rapidly towards me, hitting the wall beside him with a white stick. As he caught the sound of my steps, he stopped, listening alertly. It's all right, I told him. Come on. I felt relieved to see him. He was, so to speak, normally blind. His dark glasses were much less disturbing than the staring but useless eyes of the others. Stand still, then, he said. I've already been bumped into by God knows how many fools today. What the devil's happened? Why is it so quiet? I know it isn't night. I can feel the sunlight. What's gone wrong with everything? I told him as much as I knew. When I had finished, he said nothing for almost a minute. Then he gave a short, bitter laugh. Hmm. There's one thing, he said. They'll be needing all their damned patronage for themselves now. With that, he straightened up a little defiantly. Thank you. Good luck, he said to me, and set off westwards wearing an exaggerated air of independence. The sound of his briskly confident tapping gradually died away behind me as I made my way up Piccadilly. There were more people to be seen now, and I walked among the scatter of stranded vehicles in the road. Out there I was much less disturbing to the people feeling their way along the fronts of the buildings, but every time they heard a step close by, they would stop and brace themselves against a possible collision. Such collisions were taking place every now and then all down the street, but there was one that I found significant. The subjects of it had been groping along a shop front from opposite directions until they met with a bump. One was a young man in a well-cut suit, but wearing a tie obviously selected by touch alone. The other, a woman who carried a small child. The child whined something inaudible. The young man had started to edge his way past the woman. He stopped abruptly. Wait a minute, he said. Can your child see? Yes, she said. But I can't. The young man turned. He put one finger on the plate glass window, pointing. Look, Sonny, what's in there? He asked. Not Sonny, the child objected. Go on, Mary, tell the gentleman. Her mother encouraged her. Pretty ladies, said the child. The man took the woman by the arm and felt his way to the next window. And what's in here? He asked again. Apples and things, the child told him. Fine, said the young man. He pulled off his shoe and hit the window a smart smack with the heel of it. He was inexperienced. The first blow did not do it, but the second did. The crash reverberated up and down the street. He restored his shoe, put an arm cautiously through the broken window and felt about until he found a couple of oranges. One he gave to the woman and one to the child. He felt about again, found one for himself and began to peel it. The woman fingered hers. But, she began. What's the matter? Don't like oranges? He asked. But it isn't right, she said. We didn't ought to take them. Not like this. How else are you going to get food? He inquired. I suppose, well, I don't know, she admitted doubtfully. Very well, that's the answer. Eat it up now, and we'll go and find something more substantial. She still held the orange in her hand, head bent down as though she were looking at it. All the same, it don't seem right, she said again, but there was less conviction in her tone. Presently she put the child down and began to peel the orange. Piccadilly Circus was the most populous place I'd found so far. It seemed crowded after the rest, though there were probably less than a hundred people there, all told. Mostly they were wearing queer, ill-assorted clothes and were prowling restlessly around as though still semi-dazed. Occasionally a mishap would bring an outburst of profanity and futile rage, rather alarming to hear because it was itself the product of fright and childish in temper. But with one exception there was little talk and little noise, it seemed as though their blindness had shut people into themselves. The exception had found himself a position out on one of the traffic islands. He was a tall, elderly, gaunt man with a bush of wiry grey hair, and he was holding forth emphatically about repentance, the wrath to come, and the uncomfortable prospects for sinners. Nobody was paying him any attention. For most of them, the day of wrath had already arrived. Then from a distance came a sound which caught everyone's attention, a gradually swelling chorus. And when I die, don't bury me at all, 
just pickle my bones in alcohol. Dreary and untuneful, it slurred through the empty streets, echoing dismally back and forth. Every head in the circus was turning, now left, now right, trying to place its direction. The prophet of doom raised his voice against the competition. The song wailed discordantly closer. Put a bottle of booze at my head and my feet, and then I'm sure my bones will keep. And as an accompaniment to it, there was the shuffle of feet, more or less in step. From where I stood, I could see them come in single file out of a side street into Shaftesbury Avenue and turn towards the circus. The second man had his hands on the shoulders of the leader, the third on his, and so on, to the number of twenty-five or thirty. At the conclusion of that song, somebody started, Beer, beer, glorious beer, pitching it in such a high key that it petered out in confusion. They trudged steadily on until they reached the centre of the circus. Then the leader raised his voice. It was a considerable voice, with parade-ground quality. Company! Halt! Everybody else in the circus was now struck motionless, all with their faces turned towards him, all trying to guess what was afoot. The leader raised his voice again, mimicking the manner of a professional guide. Here we are, gents, one and all. Pick a bloody dilly circus, the centre of the world, the hub of the universe, where all the knobs had their wine, women and song. He was not blind, far from it. His eyes were ranging round, taking stock as he spoke. His sight must have been saved by some such accident as mine, but he was pretty drunk, and so were the men behind him. And we'll have it too, he added. Next stop, the well-known Cafe Royal, and all drinks on the house. Yes, but what about the women? asked a voice, and there was a laugh. Ah, oh, women, is that what you want? said the leader. He stepped forward and caught a girl by the arm. She screamed as he dragged her towards the man who had spoken, but he took no notice of that. There you are, chump, and don't say I don't treat you right. It's a peach, a smasher, if that makes any difference to you. Hey, what about me? said the next man. You, mate? Well, let's see. Uh, like I'm blonde or dark? Considered later, I suppose I'd behaved like a fool. My head was still full of standards and conventions that had ceased to apply. It did not occur to me that if there was to be any survivors, anyone adopted by this gang would stand a far better chance than she would on her own. Fired with a mixture of schoolboy heroics and noble sentiments, I waded in. He didn't see me coming until I was quite close, and then I slogged for his jaw. Unfortunately, he was a little quicker. When I next took an interest in things, I found myself lying in the road. The sound of the gang was diminishing into the distance, and the prophet of doom, restored to eloquence, was sending threatful bolts of damnation, hellfire, and a brimstone Gehenna hurtling after them. With a bit of sense knocked into me, I became thankful that the affair had not fallen out worse. Had the result been reversed, I could scarcely have escaped making myself responsible for the men he had been leading. After all, and whatever one might feel about his methods, he was the eyes of that party and they'd be looking to him for food as well as for drink. And the women would go along, too, on their own account as soon as they'd got hungry enough. And now I came to look around me. I felt doubtful whether any of the women hereabouts would seriously mind anyway. What with one thing and another, it looked as if I might have had a lucky escape from promotion to gang leadership. Remembering that they had been headed for the Café Royal, I decided to revive myself and clear my head at the Regent Palace Hotel. Others appeared to have thought of that before me, but there were quite a lot of bottles they had not found. I think it was while I was sitting there comfortably with a brandy in front of me and a cigarette in my hand that I at last began to admit that what I had seen was all real and decisive. There would be no going back, ever. It was finished to all I had known. Perhaps it had needed that blow to drive it home. Now I came face to face with the fact that my existence simply had no focus any longer. My way of life, my plans, ambitions, every expectation I had had, they were all wiped out at a stroke, along with the conditions that had formed them. I suppose that had I had any relatives or close attachments to mourn, I should have felt suicidally derelict at that moment. But what had seemed at times a rather empty existence turned out now to be lucky. My mother and father were dead, my one attempt to marry had miscarried some years before, 
and there was no particular person dependent on me. And curiously, what I found that I did feel, with a consciousness that it was against what I ought to be feeling, was release. It wasn't just the brandy, for it persisted. I think it may have come from the sense of facing something quite fresh and new to me. All the old problems, the stale ones, both personal and general, had been solved by one mighty slash. Heaven alone knew as yet what others might arise, and it looked as though there would be plenty of them. But they would be new. I was emerging as my own master, and no longer a cog. It might well be a world full of horrors and dangers that I should have to face, but I could take my own steps to deal with it. I would no longer be shoved hither and thither by forces and interests that I neither understood nor cared about. No, it wasn't altogether the brandy. For even now, years afterwards, I can still feel something of it, though possibly the brandy did oversimplify things a little just then. Then there was, too, the little question of what to do next, how and where to start on this new life. But I did not let that worry me a lot for the present. I drank up and went out of the hotel to see what this strange world had to offer. Chapter 4 Shadows Before In order to give a reasonable berth to the Café Royal mob, I struck up a side street into Soho, intending to cut back to Regent Street higher up. Perhaps hunger was driving more people out of their homes. Whatever the reason, I found that the parts I now entered were more populous than any I'd seen since I left the hospital. Constant collisions took place on the pavements and in the narrow streets, and the confusion of those who were trying to get along was made worse by knots of people clustering in front of the now frequently broken shop windows. None of those who crowded there seemed to be quite sure what kind of shop they were facing. Some in the front sought to find out by groping for any recognisable objects, Others, taking the risk of disemboweling themselves on standing splinters of glass, more enterprisingly climbed inside. I felt that I ought to be showing these people where to find food. But should I? If I were to lead them to a food shop still intact, there would be a crowd which would not only have swept the place bare in five minutes, but have crushed a number of its weaker members in the process. Soon, anyway, all the food would be gone. Then what was to be done with the thousands clamouring for more? One might collect a small party and keep it alive somehow for an uncertain length of time. But who was to be taken and who left? No obviously right course presented itself, however I tried to look at it. What was going on was a grim business, without chivalry, with no give and all take about it. A man bumping into another and feeling that he carried a parcel would snatch it and duck away on the chance that it contained something to eat, while the loser clutched furiously at the air or hit out indiscriminately. Once I had to step hurriedly aside to avoid being knocked down by an elderly man who darted into the roadway with no care for possible obstacles. His expression was vastly cunning, and he clutched avariciously to his chest two cans of red paint. On a corner my way was blocked by a group almost weeping with frustration over a bewildered child who could see, but was just too young to understand what they wanted of it. I began to become uneasy. Fighting with my civilised urge to be of some help to these people was an instinct that told me to keep clear. They were already fast losing ordinary restraints. I felt, too, an irrational sense of guilt at being able to see while they could not. It gave me an odd feeling that I was hiding from them, even while I moved among them. Later on, I found how right the instinct was. Close to Golden Square, I began to think of turning left and working back to Regent Street, where the wider roadway would offer easier going. I was about to take a corner that would lead me that way when a sudden, piercing scream stopped me. It stopped everyone else, too. All along the street they stood still, turning their heads this way and that, apprehensively trying to guess what was happening. The alarm coming on top of their distress and nervous tension started a number of the women whimpering. The men's nerves weren't in any too good a state, either. They showed it mostly in short curses at being startled. For it was an ominous sound, one of the kind of things they had been subconsciously expecting. They waited for it to come again. It did, frightened and dying into a gasp, but less alarming now that one was ready for it. This time I was able to place it. A few steps took me to an alley entrance. As I turned the corner, a cry that was half a gasp came again. The cause of it was a few yards down the alley. A girl was crouched on the ground, while a burly man laid into her with a thin brass rod. 
The back of her dress was torn, and the flesh beneath showed red wheels. As I came closer, I saw why she did not run away. Her hands were tied together behind her back, and a cord tethered them to the man's left wrist. I reached the pair as his arm was raised for another stroke. It was easy to snatch the rod from his unexpecting hand and bring it down with some force upon his shoulder. He promptly lashed a heavy boot out in my direction, but I dodged back quickly, and his radius of action was limited by the cord on his wrist. He made another swiping kick at the air while I was feeling in my pocket for a knife. Finding nothing there, he turned and kicked the girl for good measure instead. Then he swore at her and pulled on the cord to bring her to her feet. I slapped him on the side of his head, just hard enough to stop him and make it sing for a bit. Somehow I could not bring myself to lay out a blind man, even this type. While he was steadying himself from that, I stooped swiftly and cut the cord which joined them. A slight shove on his chest sent him staggering back, and half turned him so that he lost his bearings. With his freed left hand he let out a fine, raking swing. It missed me, but ultimately reached the brick wall. After that he lost interest in pretty well everything but the pain of his cracked knuckles. I helped the girl up, loosed her hands, and led her away down the alley while he was still blistering the air behind us. As we turned out into the street, she began to come out of her daze. She turned a smeary, tear-stained face and looked up at me. But you can see, she said incredulously. Certainly I can, I told her. Oh, thank God. Thank God. I thought I was the only one, she said and burst into tears again. I looked around us. A few yards away there was a pub with a gramophone playing. Glasses smashing, and a high old time being had by all. A few yards beyond that was a smaller pub, still intact. A good heave with my shoulder broke in the door to the saloon bar. I half carried the girl in and put her in a chair. Then I dismembered another chair and put two of its legs through the handles of the swing doors for the discouragement of further visitors before I turned my attention to the restoratives at the bar. There was no hurry. She sipped at and snuffled over the first drink. I gave her time to get sorted out, twiddling the stem of my glass, and listened to the gramophone in the other pub churning out the currently popular, if rather lugubrious ditty, My love's locked up in a frigid air, and my heart's in a deep freeze pack. She's gone with a guy, I'd not know where, but she wrote that she'd never come back. Now she don't care for me no more, I'm just a one-man frozen store, and it ain't nice to be on ice, with my love locked up in a frigid air, and my heart in a deep freeze pack. While I sat, I stole an occasional covert look at the girl. Her clothes, or the remnants of them, were good quality. Her voice was good, too. Probably not stage or movie-acquired, for it had not deteriorated under stress. She was blonde, but quite a number of shades sub-platinum. It seemed likely that beneath the smudges and smears she was good-looking. Her height was three or four inches less than mine, her build slim, but not thin. She looked as if she had strength if it were necessary, but strength which in her approximately twenty-four years had most likely not been applied to anything more important than hitting balls, dancing and probably restraining horses. Her well-shaped hands were smooth and the fingernails that were still unbroken showed a length more decorative than practical. The drink gradually did good work. By the end of it she was sufficiently recovered for habit of mind to assert itself. God, I, I must look awful, she remarked. It did not seem that anyone but me was likely to be in a position to notice that, but I left it. She got up and walked over to a mirror. Oh, I certainly do, she confirmed. Where? You might try through there, I suggested. Twenty minutes or so passed before she came back. Considering the limited facilities there must have been, she had made a good job. Morale was much restored. She approximated now to the film director's idea of the heroine after a rough house rather than the genuine thing. Cigarette, I inquired, as I slid another fortifying glass across. While the pulling round process was completing itself, we swapped stories. To give her time, I let her have mine first. Then she said, I'm damned ashamed of myself. I'm not a bit like that, really. Like you found me, I mean. In fact, I'm reasonably self-reliant, though you might not think it. But somehow the whole thing had got too big for me. What has happened is bad enough, but the awful prospect suddenly seemed too much to bear, and I panicked. I began to think that perhaps I was the only person left in the whole world who could see. It got me down. 
and all at once I was frightened and sillier. I cracked and howled like a girl in a Victorian melodrama. I'd never, never have believed it of me. Don't let it worry you, I said. We'll probably be learning a whole lot of surprising things about ourselves soon. But it does worry me. If I start off by slipping my gears like that... She left the sentence unfinished. I was near enough to panic in that hospital, I said. We're human beings, not calculating machines. Her name was Josella Platon. There seemed to be something not unfamiliar about that, but I could not place it. Her home was in Dean Road, St John's Wood. The district fitted in more or less with my surmises. I remembered Dean Road. Detached, comfortable houses, mostly ugly but all expensive. Her escape from the general affliction had been no less a matter of luck than mine. Well, perhaps more. She had been at a party on the Monday night. A pretty considerable party, it seemed. I reckon somebody who thinks that kind of thing funny must have been fooling with the drinks, she said. I've never felt so ill as I did at the end of it, and I didn't take a lot. Tuesday she recollected as a day of blurred misery and record hangover. About four in the afternoon she had had more than enough of it. She rang the bell and gave instructions that come comets, earthquakes, or the day of judgment itself, she was not to be disturbed. Upon that ultimatum she had taken a strong dose of sleeping draught which on an empty stomach had worked with the efficiency of a knockout drop. From then on she had known nothing until this morning, when she had been awakened by her father stumbling into the room. Josella, he was saying, for God's sake get Dr. Mail. Tell him I've gone blind. Stone blind. She had been amazed to see that it was already almost nine o'clock. She got up and dressed hurriedly. The servants had answered neither her father's bell nor her own. When she went to rouse them, she had found to her horror that they, too, were blind. With the telephone out of order, the only course seemed to be for her to take the car and fetch the doctor himself. The quiet streets and absence of traffic had seemed queer, but she had already driven almost a mile before it came to her what had happened. When she realised, she had all but turned back in panic. But that wasn't going to do anyone any good. There was still the chance that the doctor might have escaped the malady, whatever it was, just as she had herself. So, with a desperate but waning hope, she had driven on. 